Hello, and welcome to episode number 94 of the Point of Convergence podcast. As always, I am your host, Exoacademian. As our civilization continues to skate at the very edge of a new era of widespread public disclosure around the so-called UFO phenomenon, there still exists a striking incongruence between what is being discussed in government and media and what is understood to be the nature of the entire enterprise for those colloquially known as experiencers. At the public level, we are finally approaching a moment of reckoning around the fact that technology exists and has existed for decades, if not centuries, if not since the dawn of humankind for that matter, that performs maneuvers we simply don't understand, let alone are ready to replicate. Of course, along with acknowledgement of this seemingly otherworldly technology, we are finally seeing mention of the supposed pilots of these said craft in the form of recovered biologics. That, of course, inevitably leads to questions of both where and when these so-called pilots are from. But even here, politicians and the mainstream media are very careful to not fully land on the notion that aliens are real, quote-unquote. There is a strange socio-psychological game being played here where polite society still keeps this idea enough to the fringes that it doesn't disturb our everyday routines. Again, on the other hand, for experiencers, this part of the enterprise couldn't be any more real. The interaction with the beings associated with this next-gen technology is actually the most central aspect of the entire matter. And while the public conversation is just beginning to approach the notion of there being one or at most a few different kinds of intelligent entities to grapple with, what the body of the experiencer testimony over time makes clear is that the diversity of the various kinds of non-human and non-conventionally human intelligences in our midst is almost as extensive as the various craft that have been observed over time. That is to say, while the quintessential gray alien is a figure almost any modern human will recognize, that form is just the beginning of a dizzying array of many, many forms. In today's episode, that point will be made paramount as we explore a variety of encounters with beings described as blue humans, reptilians, and insectoids. And to be clear, rather than being a one-off, these encounters are also numerous, suggesting that these are distinct beings beyond the greys who also have been carrying on a relationship with human beings throughout time. That is to say, in addition to the more commonly perceived greys. But who and what are these beings? And are these forms permanent or merely part of a shifting guise employed to communicate certain information to human beings at different times? These are the perplexing but intriguing matters we'll seek to engage with in this, the 94th episode of the Point of Convergence podcast. As we begin this week's episode, I'd just like to make mention of the fact that if you'd like to support this podcast and gain access to all of my content, which includes not just Point of Convergence and Liminal Frames, but also OTC Squared and the various feature series I create, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash exoacademian or by subscribing on Spotify. And both those options also give you access to my private Discord server as well. Okay, let's jump into this week's topics. As I said in the introduction, we're going to be discussing encounters with three different kinds of beings, blue humans, reptilians, and insectoids, primarily the first two of those three. Now, as I mentioned, what we're going to do here is put encounters with the beings front and center. And as I said in the introduction, this is an aspect still not openly discussed in so-called polite society. Again, we're beginning to approach the notion of the pilots behind the craft that have been recovered in terms of the nature of the allegations brought forward by David Grush, alleging the existence of reverse engineering programs. We're just barely beginning to touch on who the pilots might be. And for the general public, the expectation will still be that these are primarily extraterrestrial beings. There is not really any mainstream understanding yet of the notions of interdimensionality 
crypto terrestrials, ultra terrestrials, time traveling future and neo humans, and the like. Now, further to this point, I've discussed on this podcast as well as on Liminal Frames that there is a notion of a metabolization threshold that we should be aware of. What I mean by that is there's a difference between what the nature of the truth is behind all of this and what the general public is prepared to accept and cognize about. In other words, again, as I just said, there is this expectation that extraterrestrials likely exist, and so it's not that much of a stretch to have to acknowledge and accept and ground the fact that they might already be here and might even possess technology that's so advanced that they've been able to be here without us fully being aware of their presence. But again, the nature of these beings, how much they seem to defy space-time, how they can control human consciousness, not alone just human perception, that is another matter entirely. And again, in many ways, we assume as modern humans that we have most of the picture already in view. We assume that anything else we need to add to our overarching model of reality will be fairly minimal, icing on the cake, the proverbial cherry on top, if you will. So the notion that there might not just be one or two or three different kinds of beings we haven't yet accounted for, but actually many, 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 perhaps as many if not more, yet to be cognized than we currently understand to be in existence. And that gets us to today's topic, again, where we're talking about these beings that are quite often mentioned in terms of people's experience with them, and yet the general public really has no notion of this. So while the gray alien that is quintessentially part of our zeitgeist at the moment will be not so difficult for people to ground into their understanding because it already exists as a concept, as a possibility on the edges of their consciousness, these other kinds of beings have not even been introduced in that very preliminary way. And yet again, they are very well attested in terms of people's experience with them. And that's what we're going to get into today. But again, I just think that the sheer numbers of different kinds of beings that we have not yet accounted for, let alone what they can do to human consciousness and whatnot, that is a matter that is such a stretch for human beings to be able to grapple with. I don't think people are prepared for that. Again, which raises really interesting questions about the nature of disclosure. How much will be disclosed? I think certainly only certain aspects will be disclosed because I think it's just too much otherwise for people to be able to cognize, to metabolize, as I've said. And the gatekeepers of our society, even if they're ready to proceed with disclosure, are going to keep that in mind in terms of how they roll this out, how much they roll out, and over how long a period of time. And furthermore, to this point about there being many, many different kinds of beings here, possessing different forms, we still have to acknowledge the fact that most people still don't report these encounters. And the more strange they are, the less likely they are to report them, even though we know high strangeness is central to this entire matter. In other words, we might have a vast underreporting still to this day around the nature of interactions with these beings. I also want to point out, as I've said many times on this podcast, that I think we should prepare for many different kinds of origin sources. I don't think we're looking at one or two origin sources. Those of you who are longtime listeners of this podcast will be very familiar with the notion of extratempestrials. That's a term that was coined by Professor Mike Masters, who talked about many of these beings likely being some version of us from the future. Again, what I call neo-humans. Again, we look at how many of these beings actually look fully human or look like some combination of human forms mixed with or spliced in with the genetics of other kinds of beings that are native to the earth insectoids, reptilians, etc. And again, that's a very compelling hypothesis based on the data that we see. That said, at the same time, we have to keep open our minds to the possibility that there might be some sort of ancient cosmic seeding plan in play here as well. In other words, the common humanoid form might indeed speak to the fact that these are future humans or neo-humans that have arisen from the same background as we come from, but there's also the possibility that some ancient intelligence planted the same kind of form, the same kind of template of being on various planets around the galaxy, for instance, and therefore what we're seeing is 
perhaps extraterrestrials, according to the original notion of what that means, but they possess the same common form as us because of some even more ancient seeding program. And further to that point, we should acknowledge that various channeled material speaks to this very thing. For instance, this is discussed in the raw contact material as well as in the Dolores Cannon Corpus. So this is something we should definitely consider. We shouldn't be completely sold on the extratempestral hypothesis, although again, I do think it's a very compelling hypothesis based on the data at hand. But again, we don't know what we don't know. And we should remember that our theory of evolution that is put forward to explain the emergence of life and the evolving of life over time assumes naturalistic beginnings. In other words, it assumes the lack of intervention or the cosmic seeding program I'm speaking to here. So we should keep that in mind when we keep open our minds to various hypotheses. And again, these are not mutually exclusive. Both might be the case. Regular listeners of this podcast may remember that back in episode number 82, titled Vestiges of the Sky Gods, I discussed cases from a book titled Sky People, Untold Stories of Alien Encounters in Mesoamerica. This is a book by Dr. Artie Six Killer Clark, really fascinating book. Now, what Dr. Clark has been able to do, because she has an ethnic background as an American Indian, is going to various Indian groups around the world, both here in America as well as in Mesoamerica, for instance, in that book I just mentioned. And she's been able to gather from people remarkable accounts of encounters with different kinds of beings. Again, we should be very thankful to Dr. Clark because if it were not for her, many of these stories would go untold, at least in general public society. And here is a quick bio describing her background. Quote, Dr. Artie Six Killer Clark brings to the field of ufology degrees in history, English, psychology, and educational leadership, and a background as a teacher, university professor, junior college and university administrator, licensed therapist, and psychologist, and social science researcher. As a professor emeritus at Montana State University and former director of the Center for Bilingual slash Multicultural Education, Dr. Clark who is Cherokee slash Choctaw, has worked with indigenous people for most of her career, unquote. Now, in today's episode, we're going to dive into another one of her books, this one titled Space Age Indians, Their Encounters with the Blue Men, Reptilians, and Other Star People. This is published by Anomalist Books. I would highly encourage you to pick up this book and any other books she's written. Again, we should be very grateful for her and her contribution to the field making us aware of these accounts that would otherwise likely go untold. All right, so with that background in place, let's jump right into her description of the Blue Men, which is the first series of encounters we will talk about. Now, jumping into the book, quote, In UFO literature, the Blue Men are not often discussed. Probably one of the most famous reports of Blue Men comes from Whitley Strieber, who described his encounter with beings who had, quote, wide faces, either dark gray or dark blue, with glittering deep-set eyes, pug nose, and broad, somewhat human mouths, unquote. Robert Morning Sky, a Hopi Apache speaker, stated the blue men, or blues, had translucent skin and large almond-shaped eyes, and were small in stature. Mary Sutherland reported that, in addition to the four races of humans, there was once a fifth race who dwelled on an unknown continent, this race, the most ancient of all, was blue. They were about seven feet tall and had extremely large heads. They possessed mind control, including the abilities of teleportation, telekinesis, and ESP. One day, they located a planet more suitable to their needs in a far distant solar system and teleported themselves there, disappearing from the face of the Earth. Blue Otter, a Cherokee elder of the Prophecy Keepers, reported that the Cherokee encountered blue people when they first came to the land now referred to as the state of Tennessee. According to the legends, when they arrived, they discovered well-maintained gardens tilled by a race of blue people who lived underground. They had large eyes and came out at night using the light of the moon. The Cherokees called them the moon people or the blue-skinned people. Throughout the complex cosmology of the Cherokee, 
elders described a universe where humans shared the world with other non-human supernatural peoples. However, the moon-eyed people were never described as supernatural, but as another race who were physically different from the Cherokee. According to one Cherokee legend, the moon-eyed people fought and lost a war against the neighboring Creek Nation. Another version of the story claimed the Cherokee waged war against the moon-eyed people, driving them from the Cherokee village of Hiawassee in what is now Murphy, North Carolina. Quick aside here, by the way, that is exactly where I live. Carrying on with this quote here, quote, Others say that the blue-skinned people never disappeared but chose to remain underground. In northern Arkansas, a 12-man speleological team encountered inhabitants nearly one mile underground. The explorers found a tunnel illuminated by greenish phosphorescence where they met a race of beings who stood seven to eight feet tall and had blue skin. The beings possessed advanced technology and lived in massive underground cities. Unquote. Now, a couple notes there. While there were different kinds of blue beings actually described there, that last description will really be typical of what we're going to discuss today in terms of these encounters. Again, these beings look largely human, just very large, and blue specifically. And again, I mentioned that that one Cherokee story has to do with exactly where I live. Now, of course, in terms of the general region where I live is part of the Appalachian Mountains. And I would just remind people that the Appalachians are the oldest mountain range in the world. And so there's a lot of history here, a lot of reason to believe that other kinds of beings, especially at different kinds of dimensionality exist, might also exist in these mountains, perhaps underneath these mountains. Again, that speaks to the notion of crypto-terrestrials, that some of these blue humans might be crypto-terrestrial in nature, although again, it's probably more complex than that. And because the nature of the UFO phenomenon calls into question our very model of reality, it's very likely that in the future, these various hypotheses we have to explain their origin will likely collapse and new versions will emerge, new hypotheses will emerge as we further understand the actual nature of reality. Now, carrying on with this introduction to encounters with the blue men, I quote, In this section, you will read the stories of American Indian veterans. While their ages and the wars spanned several decades, their descriptions of the blue men appeared similar. In all cases, the blue men demonstrated benevolent actions. In some of the accounts, the blue men offered to take the men to a place where there was no war. This theme was not new to me, as I had interviewed others who spoke of another world where peace prevailed. Unquote. So again, these blue men over and over again are demonstrated to be harmonious, peaceful beings who are here to help human beings. Now let's get right into one of the first encounters discussed in the book. And this account, along with several of the others, has to do with an encounter that happened during the Vietnam War. Quoting now from the book, quote, Along toward 2 a.m., I heard the dreaded yell, Incoming! In the mayhem, I started for the door when the blast knocked me backward and I landed several yards away from the tent. When I realized I was out in the open with no protection, I headed for cover. Suddenly, I felt myself being propelled forward. I must have lost consciousness. I don't know how long I lay there, but when I regained consciousness, I was in the jungle. I could hear the chaos in camp. Fellow Marines were crying in pain and officers were yelling orders. Matthias paused and added sugar to his coffee. Did you return to camp, I asked? Not right away. I heard another VC rocket pierce the air. I sat up trying to get my bearings when suddenly the jungle was ablaze. My leg was searing hot. I was in excruciating pain. At that moment, I doubted I would ever see home again. But just as that thought crossed my mind, the blue men appeared. One of them shielded my body as several blasts fell nearby. As I lay there, half-conscious, an unusual sense of peace flowed over my body. I knew I would make that plane to Okinawa, and I would leave Vietnam behind. How did you know that? I sensed it. I felt it in my soul. I no longer worried. What about your wound? Once the bombing stopped, one of the blue men came forward and placed his hand over my wound, and the pain stopped. As I struggled to my feet, the blue men stood and disappeared into the jungle. I knew I would be okay, but I never even got to thank them. Did you ever get your leg treated? About 10 years ago, the docks at the VA removed several pieces of shrapnel. 
That's the reason I walk with a cane. Did the blue man talk to you, reassure you that you would be okay? No words were ever exchanged. I just knew in my heart that I would be going home in one piece. Can you describe the blue men? They were tall, taller than me, maybe seven or eight feet tall. The one that shielded me from the blast covered my entire body. And I was a big man back then. Strange thing, I never felt his weight on my body, although he was on top of me. How do you explain it then? I asked. I don't think the blue men are physical beings like humans. They are glowing, shimmering blue lights that appear as human forms. I can't describe their faces because the shimmering blue light concealed their faces. I think they are made up of energy. Perhaps in their world they take a physical form, but on earth they are pure energy. But I believe they don't like war. They are peaceful beings, and in their presence I felt peace and love. I think they chose me to save. There were other Marines that died that night, but they saved me. Why do you think they chose you? They said they knew me. I believe they knew I was with my friends the night they encountered the VC. How do you feel about that? I feel like they are looking out for me. I hope I meet them again. But they only seem to appear when there's danger. Maybe just in war. I don't think they like war. Unquote. Now, by the way, you might have noticed there that he mentioned having encountered these blue men beforehand. He encountered them with a group of his friends who were all from the same tribe. And they were in Vietnam together. Later on, several of these men, including this man, Matthias, ended up having an experience where the blue men intervened on his behalf. And you may also note that while they appeared as blue humanoid figures, he also made mention that he didn't think they were actually fully physical beings, might even be quasi-physical beings, in the sense of both being light beings and having the capacity, the ability to manifest in physical form as well, which again speaks to the nature of reality that is so central to this entire matter. Now we're going to jump to another section of the book where Artie is interviewing one of these men, again, who are from the same tribe, who joined up with a group of friends in Vietnam and experienced the blue men in Vietnam. But even afterwards, he would encounter them. And this account comes from when he was living in Hawaii near Diamond Head. Quoting from the book, quote, I found my answer up there, he said as he pointed to Diamond Head. I jumped down from the car and walked beside him. His gaze remained on the volcano. When I came back from Nam, I ended up at Iris. Keeping with Indian tradition, he took me in. At one time, all of us used Iris Place as home base. We slept on the beach, surfed, and spearfished. We kept silent about our survival, but we all had the same question. Why us? We were all victims of Vietnam, but in a way, victims of our saviors, the Blue Men. While we seldom talked about what happened that night, I seemed to be more questioning of the event. So are you saying that the others accepted the event? Yes, or at least more than me. When we talked about it, the general consensus was that the event was part of our legacy as Indians. The star people had always interacted with our people. Our ancestors knew them. Our grandfathers knew them. They were just looking out for us because we were Indians. They were our ancient kin, a part of our DNA. And you? Why did you not accept it like the others? I wasn't sure. Hell, we had all heard stories about ancestors, that the ancestors watched over us and protected us. It was easy to transfer that belief to the blue men. We knew they came from the stars and they saved us. But did you believe it? I remember a story from my grandfather. He told of a whole Cherokee village being saved by beings from the stars. The whole village was literally picked up and transported to another place as aggressors approached. Unquote. And by the way, I'd just like to point out that this notion of an entire village being saved by these others is not unique just to this book. In the previous book I mentioned, Sky People, Artie Clark also refers to an account where a volcano flowed into a village and wiped out the entire village, but the night before, a giant UFO showed up and people under some sort of hypnosis walked onto the ship and were taken away just before the volcano erupted. And they, of course, would have died if they had been remaining in the village. A similar story here in terms of an entire Cherokee village being saved. Whereas in the other book, that was an Indian tribe in Mesoamerica. Now, getting back to this book, quote, You are not supposed to stay on Diamond Head after dark. 
In fact, you aren't even allowed to begin the climb after 4.30 p.m. You can be arrested by the military if you disobey. In the 1900s, Diamond Head was a defensive military lookout. Obviously, it was not operational during Pearl Harbor attack, I said. He looked at me and shrugged. Anyway, since that time, it has become a U.S. natural monument. Part of the volcano is closed to the public and today serves as a platform for towers and satellite dishes used by the government. Did you go into the forbidden area? I asked. He nodded. My experience in Vietnam helped me hide from the enemy. I considered the government operations on Diamond Head the enemy. From my vantage point, I was able to view many things, the beach, the cities, and UFOs. UFOs? Yes, I saw UFOs. I saw them approach Diamond Head and disappear. I think they must use a cloaking device of some kind. They disappear so no one sees them, but I saw them. I also saw the blue men. Did they see you? Yes, they told me to stay away from this place because I was in danger. Why? I asked. They never told me, but they told me that on the night I was in Vietnam, they saved us because we were not the aggressor. When I explained that I had many questions, I wanted to know what happened to the BC bodies, and they said they took them. They were safe on another world where there was no war. Did you believe them? I asked. Yes, they told me they would take me there if I wanted to go. I told them I couldn't leave without my buddies. They said they could not wait and that I must leave this area. That was the end of our conversation. Did you leave the area immediately as they asked? I had no choice. Suddenly, they came toward me and the shimmering blue light surrounded me. The next thing I knew, I was sitting in my car, parked in that very spot. I think they put me there. He turned and looked at his parked car as we made our way back to it. Unquote. Now, that was just an account of one of the people that had been in Vietnam fighting the Vietnam War, one of this group of Indians that knew each other both beforehand and afterwards. Now we're going to listen to the account of a nurse who worked in a hospital that often catered to the needs of many of the wounded that came back from Vietnam. Quoting from the book again, quote, Over the years, I heard dozens of stories from Vietnam vets about the blue men. Ara and his space-age Indians, as he liked to call their group, told me about their encounter. But there were others, many others. She paused and refilled my glass with lemonade. A cool breeze filled the air with a scent of ginger. Did you ever see the blue men? I asked. Yes, and I'll never forget it. It was in the hospital. It was late at night when everyone was asleep but me, Sadie said. No one wanted the night shift. It was at night when the crying began. It was at night when the suicide attempts occurred. What happened the night you saw the blue men? I asked. It was shortly after midnight. I know the time because every hour I made my rounds in the wards checking on each patient to make sure everything was okay. But this one particular night, when I entered the ward, I saw a light, a strange light. Can you describe it? I asked. The whole room was washed in light, a faint blue light. I scanned the room but couldn't find the source. When I stepped inside the light, I felt a strange sensation. I remember walking down the aisle of the ward. All my patients appeared to be asleep. I saw nothing unusual until I came to Owen Mark's bed. Who was Owen Marks, I asked. A vet who was struggling with living. He lost both his legs in Vietnam and had attempted suicide twice. When I reached his bed, Owen was missing. I panicked. I looked under the bed thinking he might have fallen out in his sleep, and that's when I saw him. Owen, I asked. The blue men and Owen. Owen was in the corner of the room, and on each side of him was a blue man. They were just as Ira described them, huge entities twice the size of Owen. They had a human form, but there was a luminous glow around them that made their image vague and indistinct. What were they doing? Sitting there. It appeared as though they were embracing Owen, almost cradling him like an infant. The shimmering light about them distorted the scene and blinded me. It was difficult to be sure of what I saw. It could have been my imagination, but that's what it looked like. Did they see you, I asked? I'm not sure. All the time I was watching them. I had a feeling of peace wash over me. Do you know the feeling of letting all your cares vanish? I shook my head. It's as though you have no worries, no cares. All the stress of my mother's dementia was gone. All the stress of caring for those poor boys was gone. I was at peace. I can't explain it. It was like God had touched my soul and took away all the pain and anxiety. 
For some reason, I knew everything was going to be okay. How long did you watch the blue men? I'm not sure. The night watchman found me asleep at the foot of Owen's bed. I think I must have passed out. When I came to, Owen was sound asleep in his bed. Did you talk to him the next day about the blue men? He had no memory of being out of bed or any of the events that occurred. I never asked him about the blue men. And you're sure of what you saw, correct? I swear to you, I saw the blue men. But there was other evidence. What kind of evidence? Owen. Overnight, his entire personality changed. He was no longer suicidal. He became a leader of men in the ward, encouraging others. He even formed a wheelchair basketball team. The hospital psychiatrist was totally puzzled, but I wasn't. I knew what happened. The blue men helped him. They work miracles. Unquote. Now, of course, it's very interesting, and this brings to mind the notion that spiritual versus physical comes to mind here, too, in terms of much of this mirrors what we hear in religious tradition in terms of beings that are described as angelic engaging with humans so as to encourage them, and often people have a shift in perspective afterwards. Of course, with the entire UFO phenomenon, much of it anyway, including the other contact modalities, this shift in perspective, the shift in worldview, the loss of the fear of death, changes around being less concerned about material matters and more concerned about people and connection and love. All of that is evidenced in this story with the blue men. Now, as I said, if these were one-off stories, that would be one thing, but actually these kinds of accounts are recounted over and over again. And now I'm going to jump to another part of the book where a different soldier from Vietnam encountered the blue men. Quoting from the book again, quote, I remember standing and throwing my weapon away. I had killed my last man. If I was going to die, I decided that I wasn't going to be the aggressor. I was going to die without a weapon. But you lived. How did you manage to get out of Parrot's Beak? I asked. It was the blue men. They saved me. How? I fell to the ground in prayer. I asked Jesus to look upon me favorably. I asked him to forgive me for my sins and especially for killing the VC. As I prayed, a light engulfed me, and the next thing I knew, I was floating upward through the sky. Were you aware that you were being taken away from the battle? No. When the light fell upon me, I thought God had come for me, and I was dead. I didn't understand that I had been taken by the blue men. When did you realize that? I woke in a clean, cool room. There were blue lights, a hazy mist, and I was no longer dirty, hot, and sweaty. My combat fatigues were clean. I felt fresh and energized. I sat up from a metal table in the room, but I was still disoriented. I had no idea where I was or how I got there. I walked around the room and I decided I was in heaven, maybe in a holding room, and God was going to judge my fate. When did you realize that it was not God but the blue men? I asked. I'm not sure how long I was in the room. I think time must be different in space. It could have been five minutes or five hours for all I know. But as time passed, a tall blue spirit man entered. I say he was a blue man, but it was hard to make out his characteristics. He appeared luminous, but blue. His whole body shimmered. Later, he explained to me that their bodies in their natural form were not solid, but they were beings of light. He said they could move back and forth between light and solid material, but it was tedious and for most part they did not take a solid form because people were more alarmed by a solid blue man. Did they tell you why they had taken you? To save me. They had been observing the battle and saw me prostrate on the ground praying and decided I was worth saving. I'm still waiting to find out what made me worthy when dozens of others died. How long did you stay with the blue men? I asked. For several days, Earth time. When the invasion was over and the remaining troops were retreating, I was taken to a safe place where I could join other combat troops unnoticed. When we returned to base, I discovered I was the only one from my squad to survive. That was a tough thing to deal with. I was sent to R&R, and I ended up in Hawaii. I was on the beach in Waikiki one night when I met two Hawaiian girls. They were sisters. They took me home with them, and I met the rest of their family. It was the first time since I was drafted that I felt like I had a home. When I got out of the military, I returned to Hawaii and married the oldest one. We are still together and have six beautiful children. I am blessed. 
all because of the blue men. While you were on board their spacecraft, did you learn anything? I asked. I learned that their civilization is more than a million years older than ours. Once they lived in a solid material form, but over time they learned how to turn their bodies into energy without destroying their soul. Soul? What does that mean? I asked. Well, now I am putting my own assumptions on them. I guess it was their soul. They were able to function as beings anyway, but maybe it was not their soul. Anyway, being able to become light beings allowed them to ease the population problem until they could find other worlds where their people could spread out and live. Are you saying they told you their planet was overpopulated? Yes. So once they found a way of turning them into light energy, their scientists, leaders, and people of knowledge became light entities. And the others? The workers stayed as solid material objects for a time. Today, the light beings and the solid beings live together peacefully. There is no intermarriage between them, but a mutual respect for one another. The light beings never age. They can live forever, but they do occasionally become a solid being so they can experience the real world. Did they ever become solid in front of you? Only one. He was my caretaker. He felt it would make me more comfortable. Can you describe him? As I said, they were giant men, eight feet tall or taller. Their skin was blue, which they attributed to the atmosphere of their planet. They had perfect human features otherwise. Their civilization has spread out to two other planets in their part of the universe. On one of the planets, the people ceased being blue over time. They have also recorded diminished growth in their offspring. Did they take you to their planet? I asked. No, we stayed above the earth. They had instruments to magnify different places on earth. That's how they observe what's going on. They don't believe in aggression. They're a peaceful race, and then they use their advanced knowledge and skills to defend themselves peacefully. How? Mind control, and by removing subjects to a different setting. Did you observe any human qualities in the blue men? If you mean emotions, I didn't see much. It was obvious that they were compassionate and that they saved me, but I saw no such thing as laughter, joking, sadness, or happiness. They were stoic, all business. How did they communicate? In light form, they used telepathy. That was a new word for me, but I learned it was thinking thoughts and responding in thoughts. But when he was in solid form, my caretaker spoke as you and I speak. He said few of his people speak as you and I speak. Over time, evolution had changed them, and they no longer had to speak. Unquote. Now, again, this is a really interesting account because we have blending of what people might perceive as a spiritual kind of form or being and fully physical beings that have a history on a planet somewhere in our universe. And again, according to evolution and technology and whatnot and further advances for a civilization much older than ours, they blend these two together. And again, this is where our categories are almost undoubtedly likely to collapse as more and more of this information becomes available, is fully metabolized, and then generates new hypotheses moving forward in terms of the origin source of these very kinds of beings. We're now going to jump into a different section of the book where yet another one of these men that knew each other from childhood as part of this Indian tribe also were in Vietnam. Now, this particular person was fairly small, and so he was chosen to actually go into the tunnels that were put in place by the Viet Cong and he would blow them up as part of a defensive measure. But to his surprise, when he went into one of these tunnels, he encountered not one but two of these different kinds of beings we're discussing today, namely the blue men as well as reptilians. Let's now jump to that account. Quote, Maybe 20 feet underground, it was the fourth level as I recall. And at this point, you had not encountered any Viet Cong, correct? Correct. When I exited the narrow tunnel, I found myself in a well-lit room, larger than any I had encountered. I waited for Sheldon, who joined me within seconds. The sight, too, astounded him. Neither of us could locate the source of the light, but the room was as bright as daylight. The walls around the room were like smooth, polished stone. Off to the left of us, a stone door stood. It was larger than any normal door, which was confusing to us since the VC were small men. As we approached the door looking for another tunnel, we heard noises coming from behind the door. We readied our weapons, planning to kill anything that came inside. That's when we saw the reptile men. Did you fire at them? I asked. 
I never got off a shop. They were frightening figures, especially for an Indian boy from Oklahoma. Sheldon whispered that we had to get out of this place, but it was too late. Just as we saw them, they saw us. They were not like humans. I would say they stood about eight feet tall and were a brownish green color. They moved like lightning. Sheldon fired, but the bullet hit the ceiling. Their bright yellow eyes with black, cat-like pupils were evil. As they attacked us, I noticed only three fingers on their hands that were more like claws than human hands. Their noses were slits and their faces were flat. They actually looked like lizards. Although they stood upright on huge bulbous legs, they had a huge tail which allowed them to move swiftly across the floor. They had a strange collar around their necks that appeared as part of their body. It reminded me of a turtle shell where their head could be retracted in time of sleep or threat. How did they react when they saw you, I asked. They hissed and gurgled among themselves. They pounced on us, lifting us off the ground and threw us against the wall. As they continued to hiss, they showered us with some kind of substance they ejected from their mouths. While I was lying on the floor, I saw them walk through another stone door and disappear. Sheldon and I picked up our rifles. Both of us were dizzy and had trouble seeing, but we made our way to the stone door where we saw the reptile men disappear before our eyes. After that, I lost consciousness. I'm not sure how long I lay there, but when I woke, I was outside the tunnel. At first, I didn't know how I got there, but hovering over me was a glowing blue giant who assured me that he meant me no harm. After we climbed to safety, we detonated our handiwork, and that was the end of the reptile men's hidden underground tunnel. But to this day, I suffer. That's why my eyesight is so poor. In fact, it turned out to be my last tunnel. Because of my eyesight, the Marines sent me to a hospital in Hawaii to recuperate, and several months later, I was put on disability. That's where I met Chester. I kept in touch with Sheldon for several years, and he became blind shortly after leaving the military. I was a little luckier. Despite my disability, I was able to work at labor jobs, nothing that required driving or reading or writing, but I earned a good pension despite my eyesight. What do you think the substance was? I think it was like a snake venom. I think it was meant to kill us, in fact, but our protective gear and helmet saved us. When they hissed at us, a long forked tongue came out in the slit in their tongue and showered us with venom. As I saw the protruding tongue, I pushed my face into the floor and covered my face. My hands still show the effects of the poison. He flipped the lever on his chair again and came to a sitting position. He reached his hands across the end table between us. I saw the deep scars on his hand. That's what the alien venom did to me, he said. I suppose that we thought we would never recover and die in that tunnel. Did you tell your commanding officers about the event? Are you kidding? We knew they wouldn't believe us. The medics thought we'd encountered a biohazardous material in the tunnel and ordered us into a hospital. I was in several hospitals. Sheldon and I spent six months, first in Germany and then Hawaii, before the military decided to send us home. I told Chester about the event. He's the only person who knew the truth, but now you. I never thought much about flying saucers and all that stuff. I considered it nonsense. I lived in the quote-unquote real world. But the reptile men were as real as you and me. The blue men were as real as you and me. I can confirm there are beings in the universe which do not look like human beings who are smarter than us and can travel the universe. Some are good, some are evil. That should humble us humans, don't you think? Unquote. Again, a really interesting account there where two different kinds were encountered with very different intentions towards this person. And again, I would just point out that I prefer thinking about this in terms of mature and less mature rather than black and white, good and evil. And I would also point out that there are accounts of people having positive encounters with reptilian type beings. Now, this might be a different kind of reptilian but I think it's also the case, just as with human individuals, that there's a spectrum of consciousness and that while there may be a center of gravity for consciousness amongst the reptilian race, some are on the positive side and some are on the less positive side or, again, less mature. And by the way, when I speak of maturity here, I'm speaking to this notion of a non-dual understanding of reality. The more beings are towards that end of the spectrum, the more they see everyone and everything as being connected and part of their very being in terms of ultimately being fractal elements of original source consciousness. 
the blue men clearly have that kind of perspective, and I would consider them further along the spectrum of consciousness than these reptilians, at least on average. Okay, so, so far we've discussed the blue men, the blue human-looking beings that are partly physical, but generally not, more like light beings, that they evolve to develop that capacity to move back and forth between physical and energy form. And we've also discussed these reptilians. And again, the reptilian form prompts the question, are these future neo-humans where a lizard-like DNA has been mixed in with the human DNA, or are they from some other planet? But again, because of the common reptilian kind of form, perhaps it speaks to an ancient seeding program. Again, I would argue we should keep our minds open to both possibilities. And again, both might be true. We're now going to move to another kind of account, a final account here, that has to do with an insectoid type. And I bring up this third account just to, again, make this point that there are many different kinds of forms encountered. Now, again, this is a person of American Indian descent who is talking about her account with a kind of being. Quote, She was the first one to receive a PhD in our tribe. Until mom, no one believed that an Indian could get a PhD. But why entomology, I asked, because this person had gone on and got a degree in entomology. The star people I met are not humanoid. From my early childhood, I had a fascination with insects. I wanted books about them. I would go to the university with my mother and go to the biology department and view the insects and ask questions of anyone who would listen to me. Now I concentrate on the aspects of molecular genetics, biomechanics, morphology, and developmental biology in the field. Are you telling me that the aliens you met are more like insects than human, and that has spurred your interest in entomology? Yes, she replied excitedly, and looked around the room to see if anyone had noticed her enthusiasm. Can you go back to the time you were eight years old and tell me about your first encounter? As I said, I was at my grandmother's house. Back in the late 70s, early 80s maybe, the federal government had a program to assist new homeowners. If they had five acres of land, the government would provide a loan to build a house on those acres. The owner had to contribute their land and labor to the building of the home. After that, the owners made monthly mortgage payments, but the land and their labor was the down payment. My grandmother and grandpa got one of those loans. They built a home in the country and were independent of grocery stores. My grandmother grew a garden, canned and dried food for the winter. My grandfather raised hogs and chickens and sold them for the items they needed from the store and to pay their small electric bill. To me, their life was perfect. It was during my eighth summer that I first met the insect men, the star people. Tell me about it, I said. By the time I was eight, I was independent. It was berry picking season and I begged my grandmother to let me go alone to the draw near the house to pick berries. She gave me her watch and told me I could only stay for two hours, and then she would come for me if I didn't return. I remember climbing down in the draw. One of the new puppies was just as adventurous as I was, and he and I were having a grand old time. When I got to the bottom of the ravine, I saw this giant, flattened silver ball among the shrub trees. Honey, my little puppy, began to back away and bark, but I couldn't resist going forward. I walked among the Russian thistles quietly but the trees were scrawny and provided little cover. Suddenly I felt a hand on my shoulder, and when I turned around I came face to face with a huge insect. I don't remember being afraid. I loved insects, and the creature reminded me of a giant insect. But when he spoke to me, I was very confused. How did he speak to you? At the time I didn't know that I simply understood his thoughts. Did he abduct you? I asked. No, he invited me to join him on his ship. I went willingly. He was a collector of insects, too, and he studied them. I was so fascinated, and he showed me his collection. Did he tell you why he was collecting insects? Not at first. He simply showed me his collection, which I remember being mind-boggling. I had never seen such an array of insects. Did he take samples of your blood or hair? No, nothing like that. He told me that they planned to leave that night, but he would see me again. Did you see him again? I asked. Every year since our first encounter, I have seen him. My grandmother left me her home after she passed. I still spend my holidays and summers there when I have a break from school. I go there to meet my insect man. He always knows when I plan to return and he comes there. How does he know? 
telepathy. We are in contact even across the vast space in the universe. How does he do that? I don't know. I just know it happens, she replied as she looked in the direction of a crowd of young men cheering. Is he the only one who comes during these visits? No, there are others, but he is the chief or leader. The others do as he says. When he showed you his collection, were the insects alive or dead? I asked. The whole top level of the spaceship was devoted to his study. There were both live specimens and preserved specimens of the same insect. They even had pairs, both male and female, if appropriate, to encourage reproduction. Why were they studying insects? Because they were the closest relative they had on Earth. He was interested in the evolution of the insects on Earth, as well as paleontology as it related to entomology. He studied how insects of Earth had changed over time and the effects of the environment on the evolution of the insects. When you left him that day, what did you do? I picked berries but I lost track of time and came home late to a big scolding. When I told my grandmother about the encounter, she pulled me onto her lap and held me tightly. There are stories, she told me, about how the insect people saved the lives of the people by providing them food during the hungry moon. What is your overall perspective of them? I asked. That they are extremely intelligent beings, and because of their environment, they evolved as a dominant species on their planet. I always find it interesting that people believe that if there were space travelers, they would look like humans. While those species do exist in the universe, there are hundreds of species that have evolved differently. They do not have the environment found on Earth, so their development is different. Thus, I'm focusing on the developmental process, the biometrics of movement, the molecular genetics, and the biomechanics of the insect and how it relates to the evolution of the insect men." Unquote. Now, yet again, with this last account, we have questions that arise around why is it that this insectoid form would arise on different planets? Is the insectoid type and the reptilian type and the human being with a humanoid form all common because somehow this is an ideal form found across the cosmos in a variety of different planetary contexts? Or is it that those templates were seeded by some ancient cosmic seeding program or is it possible that actually these are future, future, future versions of beings that originated on Earth and have since populated different planets? Or is it something else entirely? These are the very questions we're dealing with here, again, that speak to the nature of reality and the degree to which our evolution, our history, our very origin is naturalistic versus being the product of some other ancient cosmic intelligence. The most fascinating questions completely revolve around this very topic. And again, what's interesting is that as we speak, our society is on the verge of really beginning to openly, publicly engage with these very questions. And on that note, we've come to the close of another edition of the Point of Convergence podcast. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash exoacadamian or by subscribing on Spotify. But until next time, friends, from deep within the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina, this is Exoacadamian, signing out.